There's never been a better time for physical products than now. My name is Dallin Drew Bay, and I want to learn from the best minds in the industry. This is the golden age for consumer products. This is a time where anyone can go from zero to financially independent. This is the physical products movement. Welcome to the physical products movement. My name is Dallin Drew Bay. I am your host. This podcast is powered by Fiddle Inventory, the best, the fastest, the most innovative inventory management software to ever hit the market. The, these guys are disrupting this industry. No more hefty servers, no more unresponsive customer support. Fiddle is cloud-based, so nothing will get in the way of your production. And Fiddle's created a one-of-a-kind Kanban or Trello board view. So you can see your work orders and sales orders in the most clear way possible. And the best part is, Fiddle is free. It has room to grow and paid plans as you go. But if you want to get started, there's no lengthy demos, no binding contracts, and the free lasts forever. Free trials are a thing of the past. So go to fiddle.io slash podcast today to see the latest episodes of this podcast and also to get started. Well, Rob, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, introduce yourself for our audience. Tell us who you are um, and a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. So I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go way back. Uh, so I, I graduated from the University of Utah and had uh, all sorts of hopes of being a rock and roll guitar player. <laughs> and uh, I got a job at, at the time it was DOD Electronics as an engineer and uh, to use my engineering degree. And I had the same plan as Tom Schultz because it's like he was an MIT guy yeah. and uh, he was, you know, Boston was big and everything. So I'm going like, well, my engineering degree is going to be my backup plan and that's going to be my job until I get my record deal. Right. <laughs> and uh, so I got this job making uh, electronics for, um, for uh, guitar players, which was like, this was like a dream Actually, in that job, I had the chance to hang out with some actually really good guitar players. And I realized that, like, if I practice, you know, six hours a day for the rest of my life, I'd never be as good as these guys because <laughs> they were so good. And so um, there was there was one 24 hour period that I won't go into the whole story there. But at the end of it, I saw in neon lights stick to engineering. Huh. And so, yeah, that's what I did. So I stuck to engineering and we designed a whole bunch of products. And you've probably heard products I've designed if you've ever listened to the radio or any music that's been produced. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, so I did that. Or if you've been to like a, a stadium where sound is being distributed throughout the stadium or stuff. So I worked on that. But I did that for, yeah, I, I don't know, for almost 30 years. But I ended up kind of running the place that I ended up starting at. And I, I and so I think for maybe a dozen years or so, I was like, uh, uh, I was like the... Uh, president of like a whole uh, business unit that like did all this stuff. And so that was awesome. That was awesome. And, and then uh, to get to where I am today, I, so in 2012, I retired and I had this romantic notion of being a ski bum and <laughs> which, which I, yeah, I did, you know, I mean, I went and bought my pass to Alta cause Alta is a, uh, is, is a great place for it's I, at that time, I don't even know if it's uh, skiers only anymore, but it was skiers only because, and so I bought it to Alta because Alta was kind of like the, the place is more of the local skiing place for like Salt Lake people. So yeah, so I went and bought my pass to Alta and, and I was, I was really like on my sixth or seventh day and it was a beautiful day and it was sunny and I was eating lunch and I was eating lunch by myself because all my friends were still working. And I didn't have anybody. I wasn't skiing with anybody. I was eating lunch and I was thinking, man, this is like an awesome day. I'm having a great time skiing, but I am wasting my time, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, yeah, so I just, I, I ended up recreate, you know, I, 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 I realized that you can recreate too much. Mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of at the same time, I bought a trailer and um, I, you know, I'd been around the, with a business. I'd been like around the world and I'd been, I'd seen a ton of places, but mostly the inside of airports, mm -hmm. uh, convention centers, hotels, restaurants. 
and I really hadn't seen the place. So when I retired, I, I bought a trailer and started just going around the, uh, mostly in the West, you know, centered around Utah, um, just to go and see all the stuff that I had really never, um, I mean, I, I did a lot when I was, a, you know, when I was a boy, in Boy Scouts and all of that stuff. And then uh, when we were first married and stuff, we did a lot. But um, then I just hadn't, I hadn't really, I hadn't really gone out and done the, you know. so anyway, so when I, yeah, so I started doing that and uh, um, we got a handful of photographers in my family. So one of the things I wanted to do was like, I was going to all these places and they were like so inspiring. And I thought that ah, this is cool. I want to capture a piece of it somehow and bring it back with me. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I'll start taking pictures. And, uh, and I realized that like, man, you can stand up on a peak and you can look around and you go like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. And then you start taking pictures and you get back and you look at the pictures and you kind of go, what the heck, man, this was so cool, but these pictures are horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized there's a lot of skill, right? There's a lot of skill. And so I, you know, started realizing that I had to kind of hone my craft on taking pictures. Um, it, but it didn't take me too long to realize that you're either hiking um, the, 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 you got two times to really take great outdoor pictures and it's kind of like in the, uh, in, in the, you know, sunrise or sunset and anything other than that, it's great if you're taking pictures of people in the outdoors or whatever, mm -hmm. but, um, it's sunrise and sunset. That's where you get your really good, you know, landscape shots. Yeah. And so I found myself either hiking out in the dark or hiking back in the dark. Mm. And so, which meant like headlamps and handheld lights. And so, um, you know, I, I, it was pretty quick. I realized that like, if I spend too much time hiking with a headlamp on, um, that like I got, uh, nausea, I started feeling it just didn't work for me. So I started trying like handheld lights and I started, you know, I, I must've bought four or five dozen different lights trying stuff. And wow. I just got really frustrated because none of them were working right. And the, the, the light that actually, that I kept coming back to super impractical but like the light that i was hoping to actually uh get was something that was like a my coleman uh white gas lantern mm. and because you light those things up and it's a nice warm light and uh you know the light the light is like it's it's not that harsh blue led light it's kind of like warm and it feels really good and it lights up the whole area and you can kind of see mm. but as far as like carrying one of those things well, on a hike is like that doesn't work at all so yeah Anyway, yeah, so I just ended up getting really frustrated about that whole thing. And so I said, hey, there's really good LED technology. There's really good power conversion technology. And there's really good battery technology. How come nobody's making a really good outdoor light? Mm -hmm. And so I go, hey, I'm an engineer. I should probably make one. And so that's, that's kind of how Kogala got started. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> that's, it's cool to me that you could be hiking along and then you know you see this problem and you have the confidence with your background to just go and say okay i'm gonna fix the problem <laughs> i'm just gonna go <laughs> and and, so and solve it uh how how many years ago did this all start well so it, you know that pro the process as we're talking about it i'm kind of you know i'm kind of summarizing it but that sure. was a process of over over, you know, two or three years of just really realizing that like this wasn't working and keep, I kept trying different things. And so finally, uh, you know, finally, after a couple of years, we had come out with a light and I was thinking it was a, like a handheld and it was like a, we called it the torch. Mm -hmm. And it was basically, it would light up 360 degrees. And, and then I had, I had this really cool experience with my grandson and I realized it's like, no, it can't be handheld. It's got to be like, it's got to be wearable. I got to be able to have, it's got to be hands-free. Yeah. And, and the experience is we were, we, we were down in Moab and we were hiking to Corona Arch. And I don't know if you've ever been to Corona Arch. Have you ever been there? I actually have. Yeah. It's yeah, beautiful. So Corona Arch, it's, yeah. So it's the one where they like, you know, the guys for a while were jumping off and swinging underneath it. And then mm -hmm. a couple of people uh, miscalculated on their weight and their rope length. And, and uh, there were some really tragic accidents there. And so the BLM basically won't let you do that anymore. But anyway, we were going to Corona Arch and I was with my grandson and there's a spot where you're kind of, you're kind of, and you, uh, you remember you kind of come around, you kind of hike up and then you get into that bowl and you're walking around the bowl. Yep. And then there's a spot where you're kind of going up the side of the bowl and there's those chains there. 
and I'm, I'm imagining us hiking, hanging out at the arch, and it's kind of starting to get dark. And we're coming back, and I just imagine us going down those chains, and I'm going like, okay, I got my light in one hand, I got my grandson's hand in the other hand, and I'm coming down this steep stuff, and I don't know what my grandson's going to do. He's a little, you know, he's a little bit, uh, he's a kid, you know, and the kids like to do stuff. And I'm going like, I'd hate for him to like, you know, pull us off balance or something as we're coming down. So I'm thinking like, well, I want to hold on to the chain and, but I don't have, and so I kind of imagine putting this light under my arm and holding it and holding on to the chain. And I go, wait, that's, that's not going to work. And so we ended up basically scrubbing the, the rest of the hike because, you know, the sun was going down and we're just kind of running out of time. Yeah. And so, so I told him, I says, Hey, we're going to have to come back another time because, um, and it was all based off of safety, but through that like little thought, experiment of us going on that hike and coming back i realized that i really want to be able to go out and have light light up all around me but i can't have i can't, it's got to be hands free yeah and so that was that was the next part and then once we got to that then it was pretty easy to just basically i kind of knew what i wanted i, I wanted a warm light i needed to be hands free it had to light up a, a large area around me um i mean like, you know originally i thought well i'm going to wear it on the shoulder straps of my backpack and now I end up wearing it really kind of on the, either the sternum strap or on a, on a belt. And, uh, anyway, so yeah, so we started, we started, uh, doing a bunch of prototypes and, um, we did a Kickstarter and we ended up raising like 300,000 for that. Um, it, it took us about a half a million to actually get all of our Kickstarter stuff. fulfilled. <laughs> so, so that was, uh, we put a, we put a lot more into the design and the engineering and the tooling and everything than, then we kind of planned on, but it just took us more, but I just wanted to make sure it was a really good light. But anyway, yeah, so we did that and that was like three years ago or something. And so, yeah, so now we're, we're uh, selling them and, and uh, yeah. So in the, the hunting industry, we've really kind of blown up in the trail running industry. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So anyway, that's kind of, you know, it's kind of, I don't know. That's, that's kind of a rough overview for the last, you know, seven or eight years. So. That's awesome. And it came with no hiccups or issues, right? There was no, yeah. <laughs> no problems the whole way through. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, it was like, you know, we're like an, uh, the overnight success just, it took like, you know, seven or eight years to sort out. So. Yep. That's how it goes though. It, it It's one of those things, you know, our listeners are, people that are are producing physical products and i think you know when we talk all together there's this understanding of how it, there's so much more difficult you know days and nights in entrepreneurship that we don't usually discuss when we you know go through our our shark tank story <laughs> you know and we, right. we present it you know as smooth as it can go so that's why we try and dig in a little bit here so you know, you have this original idea. Did you, with your engineering background, were you able to uh, produce the plans fully and, and just start, you know, uh, reaching out to different manufacturers? What was that whole process like for you? Well, so, yeah, so we started, so we started originally starting to use, you know, I knew, knew a bunch of people who did design stuff and I hadn't really, I hadn't really ever done, um, hadn't really ever done anything with lighting, but you know, mm -hmm. lighting it's, it's, um, so I kind of dove in and kind of just started learning about, you know, LEDs and what made a good light. And, you know, we read a bunch of papers and, um, yeah. So we, you know, originally started out just trying to use a bunch of different people and it just, it seemed like it was taking too long to iterate mm -hmm. and we just needed to iterate faster. So, um, so, so I just ended up, um, you know, like on the mechanical design, you know, where we started and where we ended were just dramatically different places. And so in the process, I've got, I've got a son who's a mechanical engineer. Oh, cool. And so I went and got a copy of SolidWorks and just said, well, you know, I mean, Hey, I've learned a lot of different software. I can, I can learn this too. And so, um, with a little bit of his, uh, help and a little bit of YouTube stuff. I just like dug into SolidWorks and mm. just started designing stuff. And that way I was able to, um, you know, just iterate the design, you know, uh, really fast. And, and it, I mean, like I say, when, where we started and where we ended were just dramatically, dramatically different places. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, we ran into uh, a bunch of different design constraints. I mean, one of them, 
one of them that we ran into and we really this was this was a this was a uh it was kind of a killer it kind of really um wasn't a killer it almost was a killer um but we we originally thought like okay so we'll make these lights out of uh i, I wanted the design spec to be able to like be full brightness um and uh, no matter no matter what no matter whether if they're in 110 degrees walking through death valley in the dark yeah i wanted the light to be full brightness and pretty much all the handhelds and uh, headlamps out there if you're in a, if you're in a warm area and you turn those on it, within like 15 or 20 minutes they start getting dimmer because hmm. they can't get rid of the heat and so that basically uh, there's a thermistor in them that basically measures the temperature and as the temperature goes up they turn the power down so that they can keep the temperature and so what happens is like if it's a, if you, if it's if you're out in the winter um, they'll get rid of the heat just fine but yeah. and they'll stay bright but if you're if you're in the summer and it's and it's a warm it's a warm area they're you're they're going to be they're going to be dim after 15 or 20 minutes and a lot of people go like god maybe my batteries are dying and they'll replace the batteries and the batteries have a certain amount of thermal mass to them and so they put in some nice fresh batteries that haven't been heated up and wow it looks like it's bright again and then it starts thermaling down again so anyway that was one of the things and so we uh we thought like well we got to have like we got to have a lot of surface area and we got to have like we decided we were going to make the case the little pods out of aluminum Mm -hmm. and uh and then then we realized that they got too hot and that they that if you touched them it would burn you and so (laughs) it's kind of like well that's no good and so we said, well, what if we just made them out of plastic? So we made some stuff out of plastic. And then we realized that the heat didn't conduct away from the light uh, well enough. Mm. And so they, they ended up getting too hot. And so it wasn't getting the heat out. And so um, we kind of figured out what kind of property we wanted. And I ended up finding a paper that NASA, some, some guys at NASA put together in the 1960s. And what they were doing was it was basically different kinds of material how hot it could get and and then uh, it, basically they're trying to figure out like how hot can things get so that uh, astronauts can touch them and it won't burn them mm. it basically and so they went through and they characterized all these materials and i'm going like oh okay and so i started he did a bunch of thermal math and everything and figured it out and i go like okay i need i need a compound that has these properties and it's somewhere between a metal and a plastic and uh so we ended up well, I mean, yeah. So we ended up we ended up looking for that compound, and uh, we found we found a, a company that that actually formulated special, you know, would do special compounds, and kind of handed them. Here's what I'm looking for, and they came back and said, "Here you go, we can make it." And it's basically it's a combination of basically it's uh, minerals and metal and pla- and nylon is what it is, hmm. and then you can injection mold it. And uh, so we had some of those uh, made up and we, you know, did a bunch of tests on it and everything. And it's like they, it absolutely worked. And we went, wow. So we had to actually get a, a, a custom, a custom, uh, you know, thermally conductive polymer to make the whole light design work. And wow. that took us like about a six month thing. And I was like really scratching my head wondering if we we're going to be able to do it or if we had to uh, reduce the design specs or whatever. And I was kind of stubborn and I didn't want to reduce the design specs. So um, it was the thing that was interesting. Um, I was talking to the I was talking to the, the girl. She was the engineer who was like helping me with the with the formulation of the polymer. Mm hmm. So you do all these polymers and it's like, so is anybody else using this? Because I always would like to try to get stuff that somebody else is using because then you don't have to pay so much money for it if, if yeah. like a high volume user is using it. And she goes, well, nobody's u- nobody in the world is using your exact formulation, but the closest <laughs> one would probably be in the oil pan of a Ferrari. So we did a compound for those guys and they were they were trying to get their their goal was they needed to get a certain amount of heat out. Um, but they also needed it to be under a certain amount of weight. And so, wow. um, that's what, yeah. So, so yeah. So the, so our pods are made out of like some thermal polymer that's close to the oil pan in, in like a specific model of Ferrari. And I didn't find out exactly which one it was, but, and anyway, so that was, that was kind of interesting. So you're just subtly saying that you guys are the Ferrari of personal lighting, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of, you know, I mean, it, it, hey, it was six months of like sheer hell trying to figure it out. Yeah. So, 
So, you know, I mean, I could have probably just changed the spec or, or dramatically changed the mechanicals or something like that to figure out how to use a little bit more common material. But no. um, like I say, I think I was probably just a little too stubborn and I just, I wanted it to work the way I wanted it to work. And, and so when we found that it was like, it was almost like, you know, I don't know, you know, when you go out, it's never really happened to me, but I imagine it as you go out and the heavens open up and these angels all go, what? They sing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and everything is like, it felt so awesome when I did the test and it was working. I'm going like, oh my gosh, all this math and that NASA paper and everything, it all came together and it really worked. Oh, it's got to so, be the best anyway. feeling in the world. That's amazing. Well, it's good for you to not compromise on that. So this is super random and, and kind of off topic of this, but I I was living in Ukraine and our apartment complex lost power for, I, it was like three weeks. Wow. And we bought headlamps, right? Because I go, I can't see anything, especially at night because it's a concrete apartment. And we're wearing these headlamps walking around. They were the worst things to use and it's weird how you bring up like feeling nauseous from from it because i did like after you know 30 minutes of it i'd start to feel really like sick and nauseous and it's like why and it's because you have to like move your head around weird but yeah i, I was looking at your product before we started talking like dang it <laughs> i wish i would have had that when i was out in ukraine man <laughs> Yeah, so we yeah, so so I can tell you kind of exactly what's going on and why it makes you feel that way because so okay, so um one thing everybody's really familiar with is like whenever your vision gets up um, I mean so so your brain is basically I was so I was trying to keep you safe. So I was trying to keep you upright and balanced. Mm -hmm. Tries to it's trying to help you understand where you are in space. Um, and so it's always taken all of your proprioceptive inputs, all of your muscle, you know, tendons on your te uh, tension on your tendons. It's taking your inner ear and then your vision. And it's all coordinating those and it's saying like, okay, here's where you are and here's what you need to do to stay running or to stay standing or to walk or whatever and not yeah. fall over. Um, and whenever you get, um, whenever you get a, a, your vision is out of sync with your inner ear, like if you're in like the, uh, a boat and you're not looking at a horizon. And so, so your reference is staying uh, at, at one level, at one thing, but you physically you're actually moving, and now your inner ear and your your vision are out of sync. Um, you get nausea, and the reason you get nausea is because it, I'm, I was explained to this by a, like a, a guy I met. He's a neuroscientist, mm -hmm. and he said what what uh, what what's going on is is the way he explained it to me is he said that there are a number of poisonous uh, substances that if you take them into your body, they will uh, uh, create that, uh, they will create that, um, that dissonance between, um, equivalent to the dissonance between your vision and your inner ear. And then your body's response is to, to uh, throw it up and get rid of that poison. Mm. So that was, that was how it was explained to me. But, huh. um, so we found a bunch of, uh, papers and everything. And so what happens, so I, I, I went and got a book on, uh, actually a lot of books, but there was one really good book on vision. Um, and, and basically what it, what, what I realized is that like that spotlight that's moving around. So your vision, so the environment's not moving, um, uh, out of sync with your inner ear, but what you have is you have a noise signal. Uh, that spot, that that bouncing hot spot that's moving around, is a noise signal that gets in between your vision, hmm. filtered out of, uh, in your visual cortex, and so your brain kind of goes, "Oh, that's just the spotlight moving around," and I've filtered it out, and so yeah, you're really okay. Sixty percent of the people in the population, roughly, um, their visual cortex does a pretty good job of that, and they can wear headlamps without too much problem. Hmm. But I'm in the other half, and it sounds like you are too. The you know, nearly half of the population that 40 percent of the population that um their visual cortex just doesn't doesn't filter it out so much and so what happens is it's basically like you're you're getting car sick or you're getting seasick or motion sickness yeah and um and so then yeah so i've talked to I've talked to a lot of people and oh yeah i just don't feel good and a lot of people thought well, like well you know it's it's this thing that's pressing on my head and I'm going like, you know, when I first, when I first uh, started getting sick, I thought, oh, it's because it's tied around my head. And yeah. then I realized after a while, it's like, well, no, I wear, I wear baseball hats and I like them tight. 
Um, Cause you know, if it's windy, I don't want them to blow off and they've never given me a problem. And so I go, it's not that. And then I, yeah. So I started looking and just being curious and stuff. I ended up going through and finding this vision book and everything. And I go, Oh, it's just motion sickness. That's it. I'm, I'm car sick. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting. Our brains are crazy. <laughs> That's amazing, though. You know, they really are. I, t- I mean, br- brain, I have like, oh, my gosh, what an instrument. Your brain is just fantastic. So uh, when you when you look, so what happens is, so you, you, your eyes, basically, so so vision. So you're, you're, you're trying to see something. So when you're not really focused on anything, basically, you kind of have this big, wide vision and you're getting everything that's going into your visual cortex and you're getting this lower resolution of information and you're because you're in your eyes will kind of just scan around. And then as soon as you decide you're going to look at something, I mean, you have to literally you have to kind of decide and whether you realize you're consciously doing it or just subconsciously. It's like as soon as you bring focus to a specific object, what happens is it's it it fires off into your visual cortex, and then all of a sudden it creates these high bandwidth, uh, it creates this high bandwidth pathway through um, to your brain, uh, and basically the thing you're focused on comes through in high bandwidth while everything else is still low bandwidth. And so, mm-hmm. um, the Chinese to to see something, the Chinese actually it's two characters, and it's the character to look and to see, and so you actually have to like. You know, you have to first you have to decide to look and then you can actually see. So it's kind of hmm. and that's kind of how you when you realize how your brain works, it really is. A, it's a conscious act of looking and then seeing. Um, and you don't think about it so much because you just do it so automatically. Yeah. But when you throw a headlamp on there, what you have to do is like since I don't have everything lit up, my eyes can't work like they normally work. So I have to actually do. So now to look, I have to go like light it up decide whether I want to see it, then I can look, then I can see it. So now all of a sudden to like understand my environment, it takes a whole nother level of mental effort to understand, uh, to understand your environment because Mm -hmm. you have to, you have to like decide where to light, then you have to decide where to look and then you can see. So it's, so it's actually, you know, a three parts uh, process instead of a two part process. And Mm -hmm. so uh, when you light up the entire area, like our light does, then your eyes just work like they normally do in the daytime because they can just kind of scan around. So it doesn't take as much effort to understand like, uh, Oh, I don't have to shine the light down by my feet to see if I'm going to um, see if I'm going to trip on that rock. Is that rock big enough, you know, um, to see stuff. So, so it's just, it's just a lot easier. And we've had so many people, they go like, Oh, you know, I put this, I put this light on and I just feel so much more relaxed. And it's like, yep, it's taken a lot less effort because you're lighting up the whole area. And the hmm. other thing that we realized when we were going through the light is your peripheral vision is super, super important. And because uh, your brain is always trying to keep you safe. And when it doesn't have peripheral vision, it kicks your brain into a, a kind of it's kind of a state that's very similar to anxiety. It's a heightened state. Because it's working really hard to try to figure out what's on the side of you. Yeah. If you look to the side, one side or the other, it's trying to remember and reconstruct what your what the environment you're in is. And so, um, when yeah, so it's your your brain is actually in a much more excited state, and it turns out it's the same state that a little kid gets into when they're afraid of the dark. You know, they turn out the lights. And they they don't have their direct vision or their peripheral vision, and they their brain just kicks into this anxiety state. You know, you know, as adults, you kind of just learn how to just turn it off and deal with it. Um, but but even even adults, if you go out into an area, you don't really know the area that well, and you take a flashlight out at, or a headlamp and you start shining it around, you kind of a lot of times you kind of go, yeah, I can see, and I know I'm not afraid of the dark, but it still feels a little creepy. Yeah. And that that creepy feeling is the lack of peripheral vision. Huh. If you light up your peripheral vision, all of a sudden that creepy feeling goes away. That's which interesting. Which is like a, a really interesting thing. Because we had so many people, they put on our light and they go, oh, I feel safe. Wow. And you're kind of going, what the heck? I feel safe. And it's just because your brain is like, it's it's not, there's a lot less anxiety going on because it's like it can see you can see all around you. And so your brain's going like, Oh, I got enough information. Everything's cool. 
That is so, so anyway, interesting. Yeah, so there's a lot of psychovisual huh. stuff going on with like lighting and, and moving through some sort of complex terrain in the dark. That is crazy. Because, and I can see what you're saying because sometimes, you know, I'll jog at night or, you know, you have to go and get something out of the car late at night or something, you know, and in those moments, it, it is, it's like you're saying, you, you feel like, you know, what, I'm fine. I know I'm fine, but you still look over your shoulder, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's kind of that creepy feeling. It's kind of like, ah, something's not quite right. And it's basically your brain saying, hey, you know what? I don't have enough light. I don't have enough information coming in from my periphery. Yeah. And so you light up your peripheral vision and that feeling will just either dramatically diminish diminish or uh, almost really for the most part just goes away well i need to get one of these (laughs) (laughs) so it's happening now and i need to hop on while we're talking and order one it sounds like it would solve a lot of problems well and even just aside from adventuring like for me you know i i had that moment where i had to live without power for a while and that type of thing you know you never know when you're going to be in that situation and when you are having a a light to, you know, <laughs> provide you with security as you walk around. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's something I didn't know that I needed before. <laughs> yeah. And we've had, you know, I mean, say it's just more like, you know, three hours or something, or, you know, if it's a really bad one, it'll be like, you know, a half a day or something mm-hmm. and, and pretty infrequent. So I think we're really, really lucky over here. We got like so much, so much awesome stuff. And, and, uh, but you know, every, from time to time we have had power out and, and, uh, it's great cause I just like turn those lights on and, and since they're so wide, I can just kind of, I can just kind of hang it up and it will kind of light the whole room up. It's awesome. So, Good stuff. Um, so <laughs> bringing back on track cause I, I go off and, and I think me and you could, seems like we naturally get along well. I think we could chat <laughs> for a while. Um, Bringing it back over to, you know, the, the manufacturing and the distribution side. So you you had your final design. It it was working well. You know, the light was staying bright the whole time. Then how did you approach manufacturing uh, from that point on since it was such a unique product? Well, you know, so it was it was pretty easy for us because we had worked, you know, because I'd worked on getting just, you know, literally hundreds of products into production in my career. Mm -hmm. And so we actually were able to we were actually able to like date a little bit over our heads. You know, it's kind of like and we ended up getting uh, a really good contract manufacturer um, to build our products for us. So awesome. um, Yeah. So. Given our size and our volume, we probably wouldn't have got in the door, but like just, you know, past history and like knowing people and stuff, we were able to actually um, uh, get a get a really, you know, awesome. So, you know, you have like your tier one, tier two and tier three manufacturers Mm -hmm. and, you know, your tier ones would be like Foxconn building like iPhones and stuff like that. Yeah. And there's, you know, a handful of handful of guys in that level. And then there's like. Then there's like, you know, kind of like if you get a little bit below that level, you have some really, really good manufacturers um, that are all hoping to like, you know, land that big, huge Apple deal or something like that. And so they're really, really good. And then um, and then once you get below that, there's like, you know, uh, some tier three guys who are actually pretty good, you know, but you kind of have to know them and it's kind of hit and miss. And then there's, you know, kind of below that, there's um there's a bunch of guys that it's kind of like the wild, wild west and you just never know what you're going to get from them. But <laughs> yeah. so we were able to, we were able to work with um, some guys that are really kind of in the upper part of like the tier two thing. And so, mm. um, and, and at the end of the day, what that means is, is that, that we can get a quality product and um, we just have to worry less about like that. It's going to all be done and done the way we want it and done. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, the, you know, I'd spent probably, I don't know, I, I was going to China like once a month for, for a week for, you know, a bunch of years, hmm. you know, we got to know a bunch of people. And then there's a bunch of people over here, a bunch of, uh, sales organizations that, that, uh, we work with. And so, yeah, so we, we did have, a, we did have some, we did have some, um, good advantages. It was, it was nice to have, like, to know a few people that you could call and talk to. Yeah. Um, for sure. So if with your experience in that and looking at, you know, you've had so many years worth of bringing products to, you know, market. So 
for someone that is is currently doing this, you know, uh, a, a smaller business or a young entrepreneur that is trying to create products, do you have any overall advice for selecting the right manufacturer? Absolutely. Go find somebody who is doing something similar to what you're doing and find out who they're using. Find out, get a reference and, and chase those guys down. I mean, that's a really great way to do it. The other, the other way is you just, you just, you know, I suppose you could just jump on Alibaba and start finding out stuff. And you know what? You can find stuff out that way. And, and, but you're going to have to, you're going to have to, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, dating the general population. You know, I, mm-hmm. I go back to dating. I, I've been married for 40 something years, but uh, <laughs> um, I don't know why dating comes up as a metaphor, but um, it's like, you know, you, you just, um, if you can, if you, I mean, it, it really is like find somebody, um, look for somebody who's making some sort of product that has, doesn't have to be the same kind of product exactly, or the same product, but something similar, you know, mm-hmm. so, I, I mean, and, I mean, we were just looking for electronics. They could, they could make, uh, you know, they could make computer boards, they could make iPhones, they could make, um, you know, audio signal processors, whatever. They just needed to be a good uh, making good at making circuit boards and, and electronics manufacturing, and then doing final assembly. So just find somebody who is making, you know, somebody who's doing what you want to do. I mean, this is a great model for just anything and anybody. For any, find somebody who's getting the result you want, and then go figure out what they're doing, and then copy them. You know, model yeah. them, and. Uh, um, so, yeah, so a reference to somebody, you know, so you go find out like a fellow Kickstarter person or, uh, you know, Indiegogo person or, or somebody in a local area or whatever. And you, it's like, oh, or you you just look, look for products on, you know, look for products and companies on the website and just you can cold call people. It's worth the time to find out um, like who's doing what you're what you're doing and then finding out who they're having to help them do it. Like what manufacturers they're using um, that getting a good reference um, will help you save a lot of time. Hmm. That's, that's amazing advice. So if you, you know, you look at a, a product and in order to find out who their manufacturer is, do you generally have to then, you know, call into the company, like you're saying, cold call, and hopefully they'll give you the information? Or is there another way to go about finding out, you know, who? Yeah, well, so it's, um, yeah, so it's it's just classical networking that, like, if, I mean, the, the, the first thing is, is like, if you, let's say, oh, hey, North Face makes a product like I'd like to make, I'll call the guys at North Face. Well, first off, you're probably going to have a really hard time finding the person, the right person to even talk to. Yeah. Second off, it's a really big organization. They're probably not going to, even if you find the right person, they're going to feel like, oh, I probably shouldn't be telling these guys because it might be a trade secret. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be really hard. So you probably want to, you want to find somebody who's uh, a little more accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of times local, if, if it's a company that's local to you, um, well, for instance, um, for instance, there's a company, um, there's, there's a company, I won't name the company, but they, uh, they make uh, soft goods and apparel. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, and so we're, we're good friends with them and we've done stuff with them and, uh, and, you know, I have their products and stuff. Um, but one of the, one of the people who used to work there and used to design products from, I just ended up like, uh, through just a series of networking, I met this one person who's actually, um, now he's basically doing freelance, uh, freelance design. He's a good designer for soft goods. And well, I don't mm. know anything about soft goods. And so you need to know the materials, you need to know the processes and all of that stuff. And so I found somebody who's lived in that world and, and now that person's, you know, helping us, uh, helping us, um, do some soft goods like to, to, you know, we're doing, we're working on a Kickstarter for, um, basically a, a belt to uh put put the uh light on so Mm. because one of the problems is you look at our light and you go like oh my gosh it's really it's different how do i use it and that's that's kind of a hurdle so so we realized that we need to actually make uh, a piece of soft goods that this whole thing gets integrated into that they can just go like oh here's how i use it i pick it up i clip it on my waist and i go 
Mm-hmm. I don't have to think about it. So we're working on that. So the, the whole point of, of, of all of this piece was, is that, you know, go out and fa- find somebody who's good at the area that you're um, trying to, uh, that you don't have expertise in and either hire them or get advice from them or, you know, take them to lunch. I mean, that's the other thing. It's like in, in my career, it's like one of the things I've done a lot. I've just really benefited from was like, everybody needs to eat. So if you can, uh, you know, say, Hey, it's like, uh, I'll buy you lunch and maybe you could help me with this, but let me, let's, let's just go, uh, have lunch and let's just talk about it and see if there's anything that could come of it, you know? And then that's a, that's a great way, you know, when you share food with people and you talk with them, you know, that, you know, you may not, that person may not be the right person, but they may know somebody. And so it's just, it, you know, it's just classical networking, uh, networking stuff. But yeah, it all, it all goes back to, you know, find somebody who's getting the result you would like to get and then figure, you know, and then copy it. You know? Yeah, that's awesome. Well, it's so, interesting to me because the more the more people that I talk to in this space, it's incredible the amount of open accessible knowledge that there is and i don't know if it's because there's just a you know a lot of good people involved or if it's because everyone understands the difficulty of you know bringing a product to market and then once you have the product produced actually selling it you know that it's like oh yeah there's room <laughs> there's room in this space sure well let's chat you know i, I think there's yeah. Uh, cause I've also been involved in tech and, and the tech space is a lot less, uh, I don't know, a lot less supportive of one another. You know, it, it's a little bit, I don't know. This is just a perception I have. And I think it is important to understand, like if, if people are interested in getting started in here, there's an awesome community of people that are, yeah. are willing to help and, and teach and, and mentor. So. You know, you know, I would, yeah, and I would like underscore and put an exclamation point after that, like your last statement, and and I was, I was actually blown away at like how many people are like, like I say, would take somebody to lunch. How many people really are willing to to uh, um, like go have lunch with you and tell you stuff? I mean, people like here's what I think I know, and they tell you. It's like, oh, hey, I know a you know, you don't really even know them that well. And they go, yeah, I know this person. And this is the person you need to talk to. I, I've been blown away. And, and, and maybe it's because we live in Salt Lake and there's just a lot of entrepreneurship going on mm-hmm. in this area. I don't know if it's unique to this area, um, but I was really coming from the corporate world um, where, you know, things were kind of like, you know, a little bit uh, closed kimono and a little bit more, you know, tight vested and a little bit more com- competitive um, and the whole entrepreneurial thing, it's like the amount of like help and really goodwill, people really willing to help you and to wish you well. And um, yeah, I mean, the support I, I think is was actually a bit surprising to me and, and actually I'd say surprising and rewarding Yeah. because um, because it, it's cool to connect with people and just, to, you know getting connected with uh with uh well his name's jake nakos he's over at arvo he does arvo watches and he went to he went to school with uh my sons mm. so i'm like you know i'm like uh I, I i met him at a trade show that's the other thing trade shows are really good to meet people because people go there to meet you meet people yep um so that's some great advice i met him at a trade show and uh anyway so you just just I mean, and here's a, here's this old guy trying to figure out how to do Instagram and what it even means and sure. how, to, how to think about it. And, and you know, here's, here's, here's a, a, you know, 30-year-old kid who's out there making a living, um, started his own company, he's making a living doing it, he's just hustling, working hard, and just more than happy to help you. And, and uh, yeah, just, yeah, so it's, it's been really cool. It's awesome. I totally agree. You know, my... My personal background has been in in the marketing side of things, and it's interesting because it is it's it uh, this whole like you're saying lunch meetings, getting together, sharing knowledge, and all stuff. It it's true. It's exactly right. You know, that's I I couldn't agree more. And I think this is this is going to be very useful for our listeners to hear. Um, and 
maybe even encourage people to branch out a little bit more and to never stop meeting people. And that's why I feel like I have the best, you know, job in the world doing these types of of you know, discussions on podcasts because I get to talk with amazing people and I'm sitting here going, you know what? I want to go to lunch with Rob sometime. <laughs> this is amazing. Well, you know, we're Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I'd love to do it. That'd be awesome. We've got to keep connected. This is this has been great. Well, I, you know, I'm not going to take up more of your time, but I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing all these things. If any of our listeners want to get connected or want to find your product, where would they need to head? Just uh, Kogala.com. Okay. Kogala, Kogala, K-O-G-A-L-L-A.com. And uh, you send an email to team at Kogala.com. Perfect. Okay. And there's a, there's a handful of us on the team and one of us will answer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to come on today. Hey, well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.